to have um, a, a once a month a year resident, <laughs> Bob Tilling here, whose uh, daughter Karen Coleman and family live here in town. So that's why we're blessed to, to have Bob and his, his wife Susan here once a year. But Bob is a scientist emeritus with the United States Geological Survey. Um, and in 2004, Bob officially retired after 42 years uh, as volcanologist with the USGS, but he still, uh, as most of us, retirement means not that you stop, it just means you stop being paid. <laughs> it doesn't mean you stop doing work, and Bob is, is very active in consulting in volcanological studies actually around the world. He sent me a picture of himself beside uh, the Asian lookalike of uh, craters of uh, uh, Crater Lake on, on the North Korean Chinese border. He was on the Chinese side, so it was okay. As, as I understand. He's an author of eight books about volcanoes and earth processes, lots of technical papers. Um, you know, as I've already suggested, he's advised many foreign governments, studied volcanoes around the globe, managed many scientific teams and organizations within the USGS. And during the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, he was in charge of USGS studies at that point in time. Now, and since then, he's been involved in a lot of educational outreach efforts, co-authored the USGS's all-time best-selling map, This Dynamic Planet, a uh, map about the, the world plate tectonics, specifically intended for teaching purposes. And he is, to our great pleasure, a longtime member of the geologist of Jackson Hole. So he's going to talk about something I think you'll find very, very interesting this evening. And without further ado, I'm going to ask you to join me in welcoming Bob Tillman. Well, thank you, John, for that gracious introduction, as always. It's always a great pleasure to be here. I wish I could spend more than one month here in Jackson, but things just work out the way they work out. You know, I'm hitting the middle ears, so I don't block anybody. And uh, what I want to do today, this evening, is to reminisce a bit back, you know, more than 30 years ago now, Mount St. Helens blew its top in 1980, and at least some of you in this audience probably were not around at that time, but most of you were, but you've probably forgotten pretty much about it by now. Um, what I want to do is actually briefly review the eruption of 1980, and then subsequent activity, and then go on and briefly introduce the whole Cascadia subduction zone, which is, which is the reason why we have the Cascade volcanic arc. And then uh, at the end, toward the talk, I wanted to briefly touch upon earthquakes. Now, that's not the topic of the talk tonight, but the Cascadia subduction zone, of course, is also capable of very large earthquakes. And that should be a separate talk given by some expert in seismology or earthquakes and not me, but I'll hope to tantalize you a little bit for that. Okay, I think I've already said pretty much what I'm going to do. One of the things I want to do is to emphasize that we know from studies of both earthquakes and volcanoes that subduction zones, and I'll get more into that later, these are the dangerous places for volcanoes. Uh, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes compared to, let's say, continental interior. Yeah, we have big eruptions, super volcanoes like Yellowstone. But when you look at the historical data, meaning by that since the dawn of civilization, it's these subduction zone areas that have caused mankind the greatest disasters. Okay, uh, this is the map. I think all of you have seen one time or another. This shows the Cascade volcanoes. They stretch from British Columbia down to Northern California. And it, if those of you who've driven Interstate 5 or taken a flight from San Francisco to Seattle have probably seen a lot of these sticking up above the clouds. And that's the plate tectonic setting of the Cascade volcanoes. And I'll get more into this a little bit later in the talk. It involves the Wantafuca plate, the small plate being subducted or being dragged underneath the North American plate. And I'll get more into that a little bit later in the talk. Now, before 1980, Mount St. Helens was a very popular vacation spot for people who knew it, and mostly the, the residents of Washington State. And 
And this is a view that shows the pre-1980 view of Mount St. Helens and Spirit Lake in the foreground. And at that time, there had been no volcanic eruption in the conterminous United States since Mount Lassen, or Lassen Peak, in 1914-17. So people actually had forgotten about that, you know, volcanoes don't only erupt in Alaska and Hawaii. You know, they sometimes happen on the mainland. And, but, fortunately, the USGS had people studying the Cascade volcanoes, and the USGS was actually pretty well aware, at least in general, of the potential <coughs> hazards of Mount St. Helens and other Cascade volcanoes. Uh, Bill Pecora, who was a director at the time, actually stated that he was, he was, he himself was worried about Mount St. Helens. Now, from the data that were, that were available at the time, the studies actually showed that Mount St. Helens was the most frequently active of any of the Cascade volcanoes. <coughs> and each little volcano here is a, is an eruption or an eruptive episode involving several eruptions. And even from this, you can say, well, sure, that's a no-brainer. You know, that, that's likely that when they come back to life again, it's the most frequently active. But you'll see there are a couple of others that are fairly active, Shasta and uh, Glacier Peak, and uh, some of these have been active in the past 4,000 years, too. In fact, in 1978, two years before the eruption, uh, Rocky Crandall and Don Molyneux published a very important paper on the potential hazards from future eruptions of Mount St. Helens, in which they made a hazards assessment of the kinds of hazards to be expected and a map of the likely places to be impacted. And in that work, they actually made a long-term <coughs> forecast. And actually, in a paper in Science, five years earlier, that Mount St. Helens was the volcano most likely to come back to life. And you can read here, within the next hundred years, and perhaps before the end of the century. Now, the geologists in the audience know here that no self-respecting geologist would make that precise a forecast. I mean, that's dangerous ground. But they did it, and as it turned out, they were right. So less than two years later, the first eruptions began on the 27th of March. These were steam blast or phreatic <coughs> eruptions, not involving any new magma, but just the heating up of groundwaters and blasting out old rock. But it was preceded by a week or so of precursory seismic activity, breaking of rock, presumably the intrusion of magma into the system, and this continued through May 17th. And during that time, from the initial eruption of phreatic activity until the big eruption on May 18th, a very prominent bulge, which was obvious to anybody looking at it, said, oh my gosh, something must be going on here. It's <laughs> puffing up and it's swelling up. and It can't stay this way very long. And the USGS, of course, started monitoring the growth of this Bulge, as well as start making uh, uh, analyses of the volcanic gases and all the other kinds of volcano monitoring things we do, starting from scratch, because we had nobody based at Mount St. Helens. There was no Cascades Volcano Observatory. So we sent people from the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, people who worked on volcanoes before, and just sort of patched the team together and did the best we could. Maybe this bulge was fairly ominous, and it was growing. It was very visibly growing. And using various geodetic techniques, we were able to actually measure the growth of this bulge. And this shows the points of this particular point moving in this direction during that time period. Now, look at the time frame there. It had moved 28 meters. So that bulge was moving, coming at you, one and a half meters per day. Geologically speaking, that's frightening. Absolutely frightening. 
And then I will show here very quickly a, a, a time-lapse sequence of a, uh, a series of photographs taken by Gary Rosenquist, who just happened to be on the right spot at the right time. And have to think, OK, it's working right. These pictures were taken within a one-minute time frame. He took 26 pictures, all within a minute. And you can see how the volcano is just totally exploding, both horizontally as well as vertically. And he's not thinking about getting out of there? Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. He was getting worried at the time. He was getting quite worried. That was the last picture he took. <laughs> okay, he was at a campground 10 miles away. And there were actually people who were killed at that time. When he took that last frame and took this one, he said, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not going to hang around anymore. And, and he got out of there and he was alive. And because of these photographs, the geologists, the volcanologists, have a pretty good idea of what happened in that first minute of the eruption. Otherwise, it would have been very complicated to sort out later. And this is kind of a cartoon reconstruction of what happened. During the time of the phreatic activity, magma was being intruded into the summit of the volcano, forming what we call the cryptodome. And that was causing the bulge out here. And then, at 8.32, a 5.1 magnitude earthquake hit. And, and it caused the failure of this north flank of the volcano. And of course, that pent up pressure, the magmatic pressure and the gases, just suddenly was released, and everything is with the pot and blew out in all directions, both vertically and also horizontally. And then, once, of course, the, the vent was open, we had this ash plume then that lasted for nine or ten hours afterwards. But having that sequence of photographs made this kind of reconstruction possible. Because otherwise, sorting out the volcanic deposits and not actually seeing it would have been much more difficult. And here's a picture of the, the, uh, the ash plume around noon on May 18th. And this plume actually lasted for about nine hours or so and got up to 12 miles high. OK, so what did that? that catastrophic first minute do to the volcano. And here we see a picture of Mount St. Helens before that big cataclysmic eruption. And that's what it looked like after it happened. All the forest has been blasted away. 1,300 feet of the top of the volcano had been blasted away. It was incredible. It was actually incredible. And Mount St. Helens on that day is a, is a, represents a classic example of multiple volcano hazards. You know, sure, you've got lava flows or ash fall or carbon dioxide. But what you get is a, is a series of, you know, you get pyroclastic flow deposits. You get mud flows that form from the interaction of the hot rock with water. Uh, you get uh, areas where the, the, the trees are flattened blown down. And I'll show some pictures of these. The area in purple here, the trees are still standing, but they're singed by the temperature. And you get, and this gives you the, the idea that distance is involved. These mud flows, of course, went downstream long, long distances. But anyway, everything happens. I mean, it's not a single thing you worry about. You worry about all kinds of other processes as well. Here I just show very quickly some examples of the the uh, tree blown up. These are Douglas fir forests, just flat. And here's some logging roads for scale. And a little closer up view, you see two people for scale. These are big trees. So the energy of that lateral blast was tremendous and just flattened everything in its path. And then you have the destruction from mud flows, mud flows. This is the lateral blast. And you can see all of this going on afterwards. A little further <coughs> away, people in eastern Washington could look overhead and see this cloud formation. Well, that's ash. That's the ash cloud <coughs> drifting eastward from the May 18th eruption. Here's some ash falling in Yakima, Washington, in eastern Washington. This is a dune now. 
but it was dark enough from the ash that the automatic street lights came on, just from the, 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 the amount of asphalt. And it caused a lot of trouble, but fortunately, at that distance, no major or major damage. And then you have the mess to clean up afterwards. You have all this ash that was deposited downwind, and people took weeks and weeks to clear up the, the, uh, the asphalt deposits. Well, okay. What were the impacts of this particular eruption? You know, this is a, a single day blast. It caused the worst volcanic disaster in U.S. history, and it killed 57 people, unfortunately, despite efforts by the governor at the time to establish restricted zones. A lot of people ignored the restricted zones and sneaked in because they wanted to see the activity. But unfortunately, they got too close. Uh, lots of injuries. Of course, a lot of economic damage, socioeconomic damage. And for the first couple of years, it actually affected the agricultural productivity. And the total estimated economic loss from that one eruption exceeded $1 billion in 1980. I don't know what that is worth these days, maybe 1.8 or something. But it was a big loss. Well, after the big eruption, it didn't stop. Uh, here's a graph just showing the activity after the May 18th eruption. It was followed by a series of smaller explosions and the emplacement of lava dome into the new crater that was formed when the top blew off. And this continued all the way until about 1986 when the last few domes were, were in place. Then after that, it was quiet for a long while until the year 2002 or so. So there was a kind of a hiatus in the activity for a while. This <coughs> was some of how these domes first looked. This was the first <coughs> lava dome that was, that was in place inside this new crater that formed. And a series of these formed over the next several months. And this is what the one in October looked like, larger than this one. <coughs> And then, as I mentioned, by the end of 1986, all activities shut down and nothing else. It went back to sleep again. So, although by that time we had the volcano territory established, we were monitoring it still. <coughs> Along with other Cascade volcanoes, the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 prompted the establishment of the Cascade Volcano Territory, which is something that the USGS had been pushing for for decades and was never funded. Well, that eruption made that possible. <laughs> well, anyway, and then starting in, in 2003, after being quiet for, for many, many, many years, the seismicity started kicking up again. By that time, we had a very full-blown monitoring program with a seismic network and ground deformation network, and we were prepared to monitor not only Mount St. Helens, but other volcanoes as well in the Cascades. Anyway, so this seismicity then increased very sharply. It got sharper and sharper until we again had a small explosion. Again, these are phreatic. This is again the, the, the no new magma material, just the, the, the effects of, of magma coming into the system, heating up the water in it, and then forcing it to explode. Then we have a series of these. And finally, here, the appearance of a new dome. The magma has been pushing up and causing these small eruptions and then finally break through to form a new lava dome. Here's an example of the, of the seismic record and Bob Smith probably in the audience. <laughs> so, you know, this is in uh, September 2004. The, seismometers went crazy, basically. And, but all of them were, were quite shallow. They were all shallower than two kilometers in depth, which again was interpreted as magma coming into the system and breaking rock, trying to make its way out. At the time, we started to, to do air, airborne surveys for volcanic gases. Uh, sulfur dioxide in particular, using an instrument called COSPEC. And this is mounted in a plane or a helicopter. We would fly inside the, 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 the new crater, measuring the amount of gas and seeing whether we were 
we're getting an increase in the volcanic gases. And of course, not, not totally surprisingly, the, the news media by this time <laughs> got really, really interested you know, in view of what happened in 1980. So from the, the uh, various points around the volcano, there were just news media galore set up to, to catch the action. And sure enough, on October 1, the first of these small eruptions took place. And that prompted, of course, a whole bunch of news conferences by our staff there at the Cascades Volcanoes, which were keeping the, the, the media happy. But interestingly enough, because by that time, a beautiful observatory had been built called the, the uh, the uh, Johnson Ridge Observatory, people could actually watch some of the action from a very safe vantage point. Good for the tourism business. Well, anyway, I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, so this a series of dome eruptions took place, and by November 2004, the dome now had gotten quite large four football fields across. So it grew and grew and grew, but not, ex not terribly explosive. It's all kind of non-explosive. And safe for watching and safe, or relatively safe for studying. This was an unusual spine that the people there at CBO called a whale back. It looked like a whale coming out of the water. And this is what the dome complex, the new one, looked like by February 2005. Now, because by now we had a real full-blown volcano observatory, we thought, wow, now we can really study this eruption with technology that we didn't have before. And one of the things we did was to actually devise and actually build low-cost instrumentation that, could, that were expendable, that could give us valuable information while they worked and operated. And what this thing is, is a tripod uh, mounted instrument for GPS measurements to, to, to actually monitor how the volcano or the lava dome is moving as it grows and get a real idea of how it grows and the, and the growth rate. And these things would be lowered into the crater by helicopter like this. So here's one of these GPS spiders. They call them spider because it looked like a spider. And here's the GPS antenna, and there's the communications antenna. And we got really fantastic information from this kind of data. Uh, here's one of these instruments on the uh, whale back. And it gave us, here's another view of people actually deploying some of the instruments. There's the whale back again in the background. And here's some of the data. Here's GPS data, and people, I think some of the people in the audience could understand that one of the measurements of ground deformation is GPS techniques. And we can actually, from this set of data, show that this particular point was moving about three meters per day at that particular site. And there were a number of these spiders placed all around the dome, so you get a good idea how the dome was growing, which was really actually pretty, pretty revolutionary for its time. And that's just another view of the helicopter operation with the dome rising up. Okay, the next three slides will just show that in the first slide here shows the dome that was, uh, that was developed during 1980 and 1986. And then we had the hiatus of, of quite a few years with no activity. <coughs> and the activity started again in 2004. And you can see the old dome complex, 1980-86, but here's the new one starting to grow. And by February, you can see that it had greatly grown and actually deformed the glaciers nearby. And there's the whale back there. So when the whole thing was all said and done, when, when the eruption ended in January 2008, it shows that the new dome, well, this should be an eight here, that's a mistake. Don't worry about that. And 
it shows what the what the old dome inside the crater, the profile of it, and just for space needle comparison, you get an idea how big that dome complex is inside the crater. And I like to say here that during this time, although the eruption was not spectacular or catastrophic as the 1980 eruption was, scientifically, it was mine for all it's worth. We studied every aspect of it that could, could be done. And this volume is probably, to, in my mind, one of the best documented chronologies of a dome building eruption ever made in any volcano in the world. Okay, now, I'm going to move on here. Plate tectonic setting of the Cascade Volcanoes. As I indicated before, we have the Wanda Fuka Plate being subducted beneath the North American Plate. In the next couple of slides, the, the Wanda Fuka Plate is actually a remnant of a much larger, older plate. This is based on construction of plate tectonics dynamics by people who do these things. And we show the Farallon Plate, and here's the Pacific Plate, and here's the North American Plate, about 35 million years ago. And that's what it looked like 20 million years ago. You can see that the Farallon Plate had already broken up into two pieces, the Wanda Fuca and the Cocos Plate. And 10 million years ago, and finally, what it looks like now. This is the San Andreas Fault, by the way, this SAFZ. And so the current Cascadia subduction zone is here with the Cascadia Trench. This is just kind of a cartoon version that over 40 million years or so this was going on with the Earth. And here's a cartoon showing that. Uh, again, we have the Wanda Fuca Plate, which is averaging about 5 centimeters per year of movement sinking down beneath the North American plate along the Cascadia Trench and forming what a lot of people call the Cascadia Volcanic Arc or the Cascade Volcanoes. Okay, John, this is where I need to hit the... Uh, we have a little animation here, right, right in there, yeah. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Anyway, this is a cartoon of what what the, the uh, Cascadia subduction zone was all about. We had the Wanda Fuca plate going beneath North American plate. You'll see that you get the little green spots are earthquakes happening. There's friction along between the plates. And the red blots are more magma form, forming and rising to the surface because it's lighter than the solid rock. And then, fairly soon, some of this magma breaks through to erupt. So is that what classically happens at that little intersection there with that increase? Yeah. Or yeah. In fact, you know, this, this example is not unique. This is happening at the other parts of the world, and I'll show a little bit about that. Okay, thank you. you want to play that again? Or? Uh, we could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's do it again, John. <laughs> Actually, this animation is, is put off by this organization called IRIS, which is it's an institu it's a, uh, institute for research on uh, seismic study. Thank you. Okay, as I mentioned just a little, a little while ago, 
that we just saw a cartoon version of the Cascadia subduction zone right here. But it's actually just part of a worldwide system that geologists have given the name Ring of Fire to. And you'll see we, we have the Cascadia zone, we have the Middle America Trench, the Chile Peru Trench. And this is an area where you have most of the volcanic activity on Earth taking place, and also the vast majority of earthquake activity taking place on Earth. And in fact, from studies that have been made, it is well known now that if you go back far enough geologically, global volcanism and magmatism that produce this amount of new magma each year principally takes place not on the subduction zone, but on the, on the spreading centers or the boundaries where the plates are pulling apart. But, however, these are in the deep oceans and they're not studied well. They're not observed, they're not monitored usually. So what we do see during the past 10,000 years during the Holocene is that the vast, something like 75% of all volcanic eruptions that we see actually are along subduction zones. Whereas the most of the activity that we don't see, 75%, is hidden by the ocean water. So this is kind of a snapshot that we get. And on these sort of red sutures here, this kind of baseball stitching pattern, this is where 75% of the Earth's volcanism takes place. It's sure along the spreading or divergent boundaries where the plates are pulling apart and magma comes in, but it's happening deep enough, there, there are no explosions, there's no monitoring system down there. There's the occasional oceanographic cruise or something that'll happen to catch one. But it's kind of a random process. Okay, so here's some examples of subduction zone volcanoes. The Cascadia, the Cascade volcanoes are not unique by any means. Uh, here we have Fuji, Mayon volcano, classic stratovolcano, Popocatepetl, El Popo in Mexico City, which is erupting right now. Mount Hood, seen from downtown Portland. You know, these are the places where the dangerous volcanoes are. And they can be near population centers. And this one I kind of like. This shows Mount Rainier, which is <laughs> loomed behind Tacoma here. And we know from studies at Mount Rainier that mudflows or lahars that are generated by by these eruptions at snow-capped or glacier-capped uh, volcanoes cause tremendous damage. And I here, I, I've summarized the world's most populous regions at risk from volcanic hazards. And here you see the population around these volcanoes, 29 million, in order to Mexico City, 20 million, and so on. And all of these are subduction zone volcanoes. So there's a lot of people at potential risk should one of these guys or they go off in a big way and it's not predicted or not prepared to deal with. It. So uh, I want to just make that distinction. I know there's a lot of emphasis on super volcanoes, and especially here at Jackson with Yellowstone and so forth. But at least historically, and for the past 10,000 years or so, where the, whoops, sorry. Wrong. Yeah, these are the volcanoes, at least from a societal point of view, pose the most hazards for the moment. <laughs> that could change. Okay, now I want to sort of end up on, you know, I've focused on volcanoes up to this point, but the Cascadia subduction zone also creates a lot of earthquakes. Not a lot, but it can occur earthquakes. And they can be subduction zone ones here, like the one that happened in the year 1700. And I'll show a few more slides of that. And then deeper one, and then smaller crustal earthquakes. So there's not only a zone where you form volcanoes, but also you can create earthquakes as well. And on this slide, I've shown the data for the 
largest magnitude earthquakes in recorded history. And you'll see here 1700 Cascadia, Pacific Northwest. Now, that was before the days of seismometers and things. So that's an estimated magnitude. And people argue with that, but that, that's an estimated magnitude. And all of these also produce tsunamis. When these big earthquakes take place on these subduction zones, they, they almost always form a tsunami that's also equally devastating as most of what the earthquakes can cause. The only exception to that is this one in Tibet, which are the other two plates colliding and not in a uh, cascadia like setting. Well, okay. I took this from Brian Allwater's work. Uh, it's how you actually generate a tsunami. You have the plate coming in. This would be the one that could plate in this case. And the plate gets squeezed and it gets dragged down and it bulges up here. And then when the earthquake hits, uh, it gets subsidence and then you get uplift of the water body and that causes a tsunami. So this is a highly simplified, but this is the general idea that during an earthquake where you have plates in this kind of configuration, you can generate a tsunami. And that's a computer simulation of the, of the tsunami wave triggered by the 1700 Cascadia earthquake. So here are the Cascadia and Japan. And I'm going to get into here. Ah, okay. The 1700 earthquake produced a tsunami that the Japanese, who study tsunamis very well, they're affected by them, and have been keeping records for centuries and centuries. When they had this huge tsunami that hit in 1700, they noticed that, hey, earthquake did not occur. But why the tsunami? Where, where, you know, where did it come from? What caused the tsunami? So this started a lot of people studying that, both in Japan and the US. And they, and they called it an orphan tsunami because they couldn't link it with a given earthquake. And part of the problem was that, of course, knowledge of the northwestern part of the U.S. at the time <laughs> was not known at all. So no one knew anything about Cascadia at the time, at all at all. And some of the geological evidence, I'll show some slides here, involve what, what the geologists call a ghost forest. And this is what happens when you have an earthquake, tsunami and what happens to the forest and also the soil layers and the sediments <coughs> that years later you find this situation. So you have to kind of have to backtrack on what might have led to this situation. So this is kind of a model that the geologists have used and go, this is how we can explain these and they would study the stratigraphy, the layer by layer of the soils and, and, and rocks to do that. <coughs> And it's a similar kind of diagram, but actually this shows what some of these ghost forests look like. And a lot of these ghost forests along the coast of Oregon and Washington that have been studied now by sedimentologists and geologists. So it's coming up with a pretty consistent story. Here's a very nice one showing a ghost forest in central Oregon on the coast. And then this detective work that had been done, and, and mostly since 1980, as a matter of fact, uh, by both Japanese and U.S. scientists, they actually were able to identify that the orphan, whoops, sorry, uh, sorry about that. Oh, I've got this thing backward, John, sorry. <laughs> I told you to learn by the end. There you go. <laughs> that, the tsunami was actually caused by a Cascadia earthquake that happened on the 26th of January. Now, they can nail it down because the Japanese kept incredible written records when the tsunami struck, what damage it caused, and so on. And they actually nailed it down that it was most likely, probably, that the earthquake was between 9 and 10 p.m. on that day. But this is an incredible thing, I think. <laughs> And there's a very recent publication on this now, which is just, which is great, which summarizes this whole detective story 
again published by the USGS and the University of Washington Press. This came out in 2015. Brian, Ball, Brian Atwater, I'm going to see if I can get him out here to give a talk on because he is the guru. I'm just sort of spouting stuff here. But, but we need to hear from, from the horse's mouth if we can. Okay, so now I'm going to sort of wind up on a totally speculative note. Okay, I've showed you that Mount St. Helens obviously erupted in a huge way. <coughs> And over the past 4,000 years, the Cascade volcanoes have erupted at various times in uh, its around geological history. Can we say anything about where the next one might hit in the Cascades? Since now we are starting to monitor them and study them more. And so you kind of look at this diagram again, and you say, well, okay, how about Shasta? You know, is that likely candidate to come back to life? or possibly Glacier Peak, and so on. And I'm going to try to convince you that we don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here's some possible, you know, here's Crater Lake, which is a little different than your typical Cascade volcano. But it used to look like this, according to an artist's conception, that, you know, that's what it looked like 7,700 years ago. And then it blew its top and formed this, this caldera which is a little bit different than most of our big Cascade volcanoes. But the record for that has been dead quiet. There's nothing going on for the past several decades that we know about. Mount Shasta, nothing's going on there either. And it's the largest of the Cascade volcanoes, even though Mount Rainier is slightly higher. Mount Baker is interesting. It's not in a terribly populated area, but in 1975-76, it actually heated up and it had some very minor explosions. That was before Mount St. Helens now. And the USGS sent some people there to study. They found increased fumarolic activity, this steam blast activity, and also increased melting of the glacier that occupies certain crater. But then that died down in 76 and nothing happened. Lassen Peak. That last erupted in 1914 to 17. Very tranquil now. But in 1915, wasn't so tranquil. You know, that, that's a fairly respectable eruption plume going up. And luckily, it was in a very remote place, so no one was hurt, and it was very minimal damage. That same eruption plume from the city of Red Bluff. Probably some of you might have driven along there on the Interstate 5 at one time or another. I want to spend a few minutes here on three sisters. This is in Central Oregon. And this is interesting now. Given in, keeping in mind that in, before Mount St. Helens 1980, we were able to monitor swelling of the volcano. And now we know more about how to do these things. And in 1996, from some satellite radar information, see this shows a bullseye here, shown by the satellite data. That indicates puffing up around that bullseye. And in the center of the bullseye is the maximum puffing up or maximum uplift. And if you were to take that data and actually make profiles of how the land came up from what it was in 1996 up to this point, you'll see that it's come up by these over 100 millimeters. OK, that, now that doesn't, it's not like the 1.5 meters per day of Mount St. Helens, <laughs> but this was measurable and significant. It was rising. And some continued studies of that radar data, plus some GPS data in the yellows and greens, show that this inflation or this puffing up actually continued probably into 2011, although it was starting to flat out. And I don't have any information on what's happened since then. So but now we have techniques that we can actually monitor these volcanoes that do come back to life much more easily than we did in 1980. Now, this, I think some of you have seen this slide before. The, this shows the sizes 
of some of the eruptions that we know about. And Mount St. Helens, on the scale of things, shown down here, the little green blob, is tiny compared to Pinatubo or Tambora, which is the largest known historical eruption. Then we, of course, have our big Yellowstone eruption, and Toba Caldera is a big one, uh, super volcano as well. But the point I want to make here is that most of these uh, volcanoes uh, that are smallish are the ones in the subduction zone. And they also are the ones that tend to erupt more frequently. Here I've summarized some of the data of the Smithsonian Volcano Database. Uh, this VEI is an index of the explosivity of a volcano. The higher the number, the more explosive it is. A VEI 7 is, is large, quite large. And in historical time, there's only been one. And that's the Tambora eruption of 1815. And all the other ones have been in geological time. Whereas something the size of Mount St. Helen, the VEI 5, you can see in the past 10,000 years, there's been 84 of those. So it's, it's more common. And if you look at that, the frequency of that, taking the same data, something of a Mount St. Helen size occurs somewhere around the world once every 10 years or so, about a decade kind of frequency. Whereas a, a VEI 6 is a longer interval, and a VEI 7 is something on the order of 500 to 1,000 years separating when you might get one of these big ones again. Then, of course, when you get to the Yellowstone size thing, it's, it's even more. <laughs> Okay, now, so given that, what I've just showed you previously, that given the fact that Cascadia is just one part of this global system, the Ring of Fire, and so far we have no monitoring data that gives us any clues on when the next big Cascadia eruption is going to go off. We just don't have enough information on that. How about earthquakes? Uh, people have been looking at those. And studies have shown there's been at least seven big earthquake events, including the 1700, in the past 3,500 years. And this suggests a recurrence interval of something 400 to 600 years. And the 1700 was 300 years ago, so you know maybe in 100 years or so or more, we might get another one off the Cascadia uh, trail. <coughs> But there's been a recent study by this guy, uh, Chris Goldfinger at Oregon State. And he's saying that from the studies, both onshore and offshore, that the, the, the recurrence interval could be smaller. And it could be as small as, depending what part of the system you're in, 220 to 380 years. But this is, again, a fairly long time for people to, to grapple with. So, here's the, the, the $64 question, and I'm going to say that we don't have the answers to those questions. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is that we should not get surprised. The fact now is that for volcanoes, those that are well monitored by volcano observatories, we should not be caught off guard. We should catch the first inklings of, of the reawakening of any particular volcanic system. And hopefully, when we get enough data and can track it, we can make the kind of forecast that was made for Mount St. Helens in 1980. And also more significantly, we made a very successful forecast for the 1991 Pinatubo eruption, where literally <coughs> thousands and thousands of lives were saved. It's, we made that forecast that people should be evacuated, and they were, and so they were out of harm's way. So for volcanoes, we can do that pretty well. For earthquakes, uh, I'm not enough of a seismologist to know. Uh, I think we have to see a lot more data first and a lot more occurrences of Cascadia earthquakes first before we can really predict the next one. See, uh, so far, for at least Cascadia earthquakes, other than the 1700 orphan earthquake or orphan tsunami, it's been based on geological evidence of the sedimentary deposits and the ghost forest. So
So we have a very small track record on real modern, see, physical monitoring data. So there too, I, I probably would like to think that it, at this stage of the game, it would be pretty hard to tell. And that's it, and I'm going to stop and answer questions.
Maybe if we had comparably good detailed information for the other volcanic systems, maybe the interval between 10,000 years and 8,000 years for some other volcano might be most frequently active. What is well known around the world is that these volcanic arcs, like the Cascadia volcanic arcs, they have gaps in them. They're segmented. So whether one particular segment or one part of the segment is active over a period of geologic time is the same for all the segments or not is we probably won't ever get the information we need on that. signs of what we call unrest. It was having earthquakes, and it was actually deforming. And the question was, was that media frenzy, or was, that some, was there some scientific basis for that? And the answer, yes, there was scientific data for that. In fact, the, the, uh, based on repeats of level line studies across the caldera, for, they actually showed that there was a certain amount of up there. Then instrumentation was put in, both in terms of uh, what were called geodometers in those days, and laser beam devices, and then later GPS and seismometers that showed actually very well that the whole system was puffing up and inflating. And actually, uh, we, we, the USGS, actually created a observatory called Long Valley Observatory to study Long Valley because of that. Now, the media did get in a frenzy over this thing, okay, as you might expect. And in particular, the people who really got into a frenzy were the real estate developers. <laughs> okay. And uh, well, my wife is not here at the moment, you see, she's been a realtor now for 40 some, some years. That the, the realtors, the real estate people in Mammoth Lakes, which is a big ski resort area in Long Valley, California, told the scientists why don't you guys shut up? You're driving down the prices. <laughs> no, really. And, and it actually got very ugly at the time. There were signs posted up in some of the cafes and restaurants in Mammoth Place. USGS not welcome. <coughs> Go home. One of our people got death threats. No, actually, it was, it was pretty bad. But as it turned out, Long Valley did not erupt. But it, it calmed down, and now for the moment, it's just kind of waffling around, not doing much. But now we have the instrumentation and all of the background information that should it really get serious, we're going to have an analog that we didn't have before. Bob, you might mention, though, that Long Valley, some of the eruptive events there are as big as some of the big ones at Yellowstone. So there's a real reason for USGS to be oh, concerned. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think on, on one of the slides I showed, it actually showed the line for Long Valley. I mean, it's, Long Valley's bigger than certainly the uh, Tambora volume of 1815 by a long shot. Yeah. Good point, John. Uh, on a less hysterical note, uh, <laughs> you mentioned in one of the graphs, you mentioned, I guess, it would be crystalline water in the rock yeah. in the subduction zone enabling the melting of the rock. Can right. you explain the mechanism of that? Well, from experimental studies that people have done in laboratories with these subject rock materials under different pressures and, 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 and water pressure, having a high water vapor pressure lowers the melting point of a lot of the minerals that make up solid rock. So yeah, no, absolutely, that's been shown in the lab and it's a very plausible explanation that when these rocks containing hydroxyl ions are broken down, it, it, it increases the hydrous pressure which then it acts like a, like a, what's the word I want, the uh, fuse. Flux. 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 flux, thank you. That, that's the word I wanted. It acts like a fluxing agent and it, and it, and it promotes melting of solid rock. Okay. That's right. Can you describe that whale back? It looked like it was a totally different material than the rest of the film being built. Um, I can only describe what I've seen in pictures because I, I haven't really studied that per se, but what it is... The whaleback. Yeah, the whaleback. 
Well, then, you know, it's a big spine, so it just pictures something that's very viscous, and oozing up on kind of like a fissure, linear opening. The easiest access is to come up, and it actually gets smoothed off. You get scraped off, so the part that's rising, it's coming through in a very uh, fluid way, and the stuff around it is the more broken, rubbly stuff, and later on it's fallen down. So the fact that it's not all rubbly looking <coughs> tells me that it's newer and fresher. Another question. Is there a glacier formation that occurs inside the caldera of Mount Saint? Yes. There were glaciers before 1980, and glaciers still exist now, but they're they're being compromised by all the <laughs> dough that's coming <laughs> around it. Yeah, no, there's there still glaciers within the crater of Mount St. Helens, yes, absolutely. But it's uh, very complex now. There's a question back there. The campground where those photographs of Mount St. Helens exploded. Right. Would you show us where that's located on that uh, film you have of the destruction zones around? Oh, yeah, the I can do that. It was to the uh, northeast of the volcano. We can find that anywhere. It has to be that one on the impacts of your yeah. Oh, yeah. No, actually, it, it was, uh, was a lake. It was a campground that was about 10 miles to the northeast of the summit of the volcano. It was called Bear Lake. Johnson was on cold water too. And the, they, yeah, estimate, Dave Johnson, yeah. they, they estimate that uh, the blast was traveling at 300 miles an hour when it hit his trailer. Can you show him where cold water two was? Would be about here. <laughs> no, actually, you know, being the guy who was that happened on my shift, it was my job to tell his parents that, that he had disappeared. And there was a conscious decision to have Dave, this, this was a camp that we were making measurements on, on the dome, on the growth of the dome. It's five miles away. And from all the geological evidence that we had from studies before, and when Mount St. Helens had been before, we collectively, his colleagues, decided that being five miles away and on a ridge, not down below, where he could be caught by a mud flow, he was safe. Well, the blast was unprecedented in historical time. So, yeah, what's that? Do you have any idea what the overpressure would be in the area? Of the I can't answer that. The, the question was, what would be the overpressure? Yeah, I, looking like a nuclear explosion. Oh, absolutely. You've got a lot of mass and a lot of velocity. Oh, yeah. And so you got a lot of force going. Oh, I'm sure. Now, I don't know whether they're. Uh, there are pressure waves that have been studied yeah. from for volcanic eruption. And there may be some information on that, but I don't have it in my head. Peter? This was more steep than any of the other volcanic eruptions. I mean, the landslide also the lava that flew the steam <coughs> made the lake the tree dead. It was very different from a lot of other eruptions. Is that right? No, no, that's not strictly right. It was not steam. It was actually, when when that landslide block started, it decapitated this molten mm -hmm. cryptodome. And so you basically, uh, you vesiculated that, you fragmented that. So you had ash going out as well, horizontally as well as vertically at the same time. No, no, it, 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 yeah, sure, there was steam with it, but it had a lot of solid material in it. In fact, you can actually see that from the trees that have been sheared off. You'll see on the windward side the 
the, the, the ash particle embedded into the tree trunk. Oh, yeah. Yes? In Jackson, we had a lot of ash. Was that ash strictly from the power of the explosion, or was it prevailing winds, or what, what caused all that ash? So far well, actually, the, 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 I probably should have showed him that, but the ash fall from the, from the eruption. And uh, from the amount you got in Jackson, my feeling would have been, would have been a light dusting at best. At best. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they, they picked up some ash in the air filter system in Washington, D.C., but again, it just dust, just fine stuff. So my guess would be that in Jackson here, if you got some ash, you, you might have seen something on the windshield of your car, perhaps, or something. There was ash on the hood of my truck. Okay, yeah. fair enough. But probably less than one millimeter, I would guess. It's very, very Yeah. Just a dust. Right, right. There was ash in Durango on my car, too, and you could write your name in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I should have showed that slide up there. I should have that. No, actually, um, the, the amount that, that the people actually measured, and they, and they took the one millimeter isopack, which means that they, they draw a line around where the ash around down the wind of the volcano would measure at least one, one millimeter. That does not mean to say there were local pockets where people didn't either make the studies, never got there, so that what was actually mapped is based on data and measurements made at the time. So had it been done differently or more people doing it, uh, the ash distribution might have looked different. Yes? So uh, in Laramie, I saw a fine ash falling that day. Yeah. I took a piece of double sticky tape, put it on a bicycle seat, and my part went off by, by the university. Came out an hour later, stuck on the SEM. Yeah. Got a beautiful picture of the ash. Some of them were little fragments of rock, which must have been part of the upper part that blew out. And some of them were streamers of glass, which must have been blobs of milk that were falling at the time. Uh, oh, I'm uh, sure that was the case. I think. And I, it was, was published in EOS, as a cover of EOS one time. So it was the first paper out on uh, the St. Helens direction. Oh, really? Thank you. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> first, this is Ron Frost, by the way, who has been a past speaker, and he's promised he will come back uh, and give another great talk on the tea times. Any other questions about it? Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Do not put the chairs away tonight. <laughs> Thank you, because there's somebody in here in the morning that wants this set up like this. So thanks for being uh, good. And uh, in, two, in about three times, we'll have Marvin Assey from um, 